Eric, thanks for coming out this morning. Uh, this is my 1968 Mooney M20C. This is a short body, early style Mooney, and I wanted to cover some of the differences between the vintage series Moonies, the pre-J, pre-201 uh, series aircraft. So anyway, basically uh, Al Mooney designed this aircraft in the early 50s, and it was actually certified uh, from an M18 Mite to an M20 in the uh, mid 50s, and it was his 20th design, kind of his masterpiece. So started out with a single seat uh, M18 with this wing, and uh, moved over to a four four place aircraft in the mid 50s. He stayed on with the company long enough to basically get it certified. But the really interesting thing uh, was the the foundational point of the wing and. Uh, how all that worked and so these actually started out with an 0320 Lycoming initially and uh, in the early years the A models and even the pre-A models uh, had the 0320 well I say that it actually had a Continental first and they had some issues and moved up to the 0320 and then they found out in about 58 that the 0360 worked really well and so this actually is a variant of the 0360 it's a 0360 A1D the 0360, of course, opposed, and it's carbureted. Uh, a lot of these have the IO360. Basically, the difference between the IO360 and 360, there's a couple of telltale signs. You've got this chin here, and uh, the intake, of course, that's a Challenger K&N style air filter that's been upgraded. And you've also got some uh, humps on the cowl to accommodate the angle valve uh, engine on the IO360 on the E models. Also here, this is alternator cooling, but there's also a boost door, and don't mind the bug guts, but there's actually a boost door that can be opened up, and that is said, <laughs> keyword said, to have given, given you about a, an inch of manifold pressure. Um, one of the uh, really interesting things is uh, ARI, back in the 90s, developed this style, kind of a J-style cowling, and uh, this is actually all open. They call it the Gorilla Snout. This is all open uh, in uh, the uh, factory configuration, and that's actually been upgraded. It's supposed to give you three knots or something like that. I'm not sure how much that helps. There's also a AD on this hub, uh, the factory Hartzell prop, and that has been fixed by putting the Hartzell scimitar with a suffix B hub, and that does away with the 100-hour eddy current inspection having to take it to the prop shop and all that so that was a huge selling point when I bought this thing uh, guess we'll kind of walk around uh, these cow flaps were actually fixed in 68 and they've been modified to open up and of course this thing is not a hanger queen it has been flown and all that sort of thing the uh, the gear also is kind of interesting uh, it was designed with hockey puck uh, style uh, donuts is uh, what the Mooney community calls them and of course the gear sucks up in the well and there is kind of a protrusion with the gear door how that uh, when the gear is up there is slight it does stick out just a little bit just with the gear doors but kind of part of life and of course the uh, main gear has four donuts four uh, rubber shock discs so what can happen is people say, oh, well, you know, Moonies, they uh, have oscillation and different things like that. And if you land these on the numbers, and on the numbers being 100 on downwind, 90 on base, and 80 on final, short, you know, cross the fence at 75 and you're good. And uh, it really settles down nicely. Um, some of the later J models have an extended gear door that actually pulls in the, uh, closes in the entire wheel well, so that, that kind of helps. Uh, we've actually done a brake caliper mod that moves the brake calipers forward on this aircraft. And what that does is the way they were designed from the factory, there is a, uh, the, the brake caliper is actually in the slipstream. And what that does is moves it forward and gets it out of the slipstream. I've got some before and after photos and it's really evident. You wouldn't think that it would make that much difference, but, and again, Speed mods are really more of a cumulative thing, and it, you don't really get a whole lot by doing one or two speed mods. It's kind of an exponentially. The more that you do, they all work in conjunction uh, to, to help you a little bit. Um, while we're in this area, we can talk about the windshield. 
they had a two-piece windshield, if I'm not mistaken, up until about 66, uh, 67, I believe, introduced the one-piece windshield. A really popular mod is the 201 windshield. And what it'll actually do is uh, sweep the windshield forward a little bit more, so it's actually more swept, uh, swept back and more uh, streamlined. You can retain some avionics access doing that, but it's not been enough for, for me to even consider just because there is so much avionics access and at some point I would like to really go on the avionics and do some upgrades, do some uh, Garmin stuff. But uh, So there's actually a bar in the center and that's the only part that is exposed of the space frame design. And basically, it's the same thing as what you see in modern day race cars and off-road vehicles. And it actually goes down this entire section of the fuselage and it encapsulates the entire fuselage. When Al Mooney was in high school, he had already been doing some drafting and different things. His dad worked for the railroad. Uh, he was a railroad designer. And so he was familiar with drafting he excelled in mathematics, which made him really just a, had a natural God-given talent for design and engineering. And uh, a teacher asked him what he wanted to do with his life. And he said, well, I want to develop airplanes. I you know, think that having the uh, ability to develop a safe airplane would be great. And his teacher responded with, there is no such thing as a safe airplane. Of course, we're talking about the 1920s. So at that point in time, that was probably relatively true. So a big thing for me is the space frame. Uh, they've actually had hangar doors inadvertently collapse on these fuselage before and they've been able to salvage the airplane because it's such a resilient design. The wet wing is another interesting thing. It's kind of a caveat when you are going to purchase one of these things because they are, they do tend to leak some and different things like that. But if you gently land, then it's typically not that big of a deal. And this wing was actually derived, I believe the most famous, of course, was the North American P-51. And it's what we call a laminar flow wing. The really interesting thing is, is there has never been a structural failure on this wing. It has a one-piece spar from tip to tip. We'll go down there in a second, and I'll kind of show you how rigid it is. And some people would even attribute the Mooney to have a rough ride because of that and turbulence and different things. I'm not sure how true that is. There are some uh, flush, flush mount uh, rivets, flush rivets and uh, on the leading edge and that really helps with drag. Uh, Al Mooney was really concerned with trying to reduce drag as much as possible and he certainly achieved that. And there are 52 gallons, it holds 26 aside, 50 usable and uh, this is a stall strip that will actually allow the wing to fall, uh, the leading edge to stall first. When we go outbound, this is our stall warning. And we do have a heated pitot tube. Uh, by the way, this is a great IFR platform. It really does well. It excels at IFR just because of how stable it is. The wingspan is 35, 36 feet, and it just is a really, really stable platform. Right. This is a flat wing tip. Some of the later variants have kind of molded slipstream wing tips that are really attractive. Uh, this is what this comes with and it works just fine. Of course, we've got a wide aileron with very short throw. And of course you can see how little it throws and I'm not sure if you can see those cockpit controls, but they move very little from side to side when they're at full deflection, which is really interesting because you know, if you're flying a Cherokee or something, you almost have to turn all the way uh, full lock. So uh, the wingtip, the, the spar goes from tip to tip and you can actually just move it just ever so slightly and see the other wing. It's very responsive, very resilient. It's, it's planted. From this angle, you can really see uh, the middle post, the B post is actually where the frame, the space frame, there's a post there. In the J model, they actually remove that, but it's existent in the G and the F and also the E in, in that, uh, that era. And what that does is you can see how centered the gravity is. The center of gravity is just very condensed, very contained. Bonanza is another aircraft. 
the FCG, the pilot's really the only thing that's kind of forward of the of the spar, and everything else is aft. Same Cherokee Six and some of the different aircraft that are out there. So what's really interesting is it's about a thousand pounds, thousand fifteen, I think, uh, useful load, and it really will carry just about anything you can close the doors around, even with just the. 180 horse versus the 200 horse IO360. So it does really well. When we move on down to look at the flap, it's a very, very narrow flap, but it extends the entire length to the fuselage, all the way from the aileron to the fuselage. And these are actually hydraulically operated flaps. So the A model had an all wood wing and really were highly sought after aircraft for a lot of guys for a lot of years, but due to the upkeep and what all is involved in maintaining a wood wing aircraft, I mean, it, it really can be pretty cumbersome. So uh, B model, and that was in 60, I believe 58 through 60 was the A model, 61, one year, B model. The only difference really between a B model and a C model, I believe it's somewhere around a 100 pounds gross weight increase from the B to the C in 61 to 62, and had the same engine. It had manually operated flaps, and it had just a little bit less rudder throw on the tail. So that was really predominantly the only uh, difference. Bs, great aircraft, nothing wrong with a B model. We've got a really wide access door got the uh, 406 ELT and the PC positive control wing leveler, the vacuum pods and everything that are associated with that are located back here. The wing leveler, let me talk about that for a second. It's kind of an early poor man's autopilot, but it works really well. You kick that thing on. I've actually got a rubber band around the actuator on the yoke right now and I keep that on predominantly unless I'm an IFR or training for IFR. I've got my IFR check ride in a couple of weeks so really getting ready for that and it's been just so far just an awesome performer for IFR, very stable. And what that does is you do have some pitch and roll trim, not much. Uh, as far as rolling to a heading, you're pretty much going to have to do that manually but as far as holding a heading, it does phenomenally. It works really well. As we walk all the way back, again, we talked about the bulkheads, the separators. We do have two static sources there in the tail, uh, and they actually connect in the middle. And so you've got redundancy. Uh, if you were to get some blockage on one side, you've got that. Of course, no alternate static, so you have to break the VSI if you uh, have some kind of blockage, some kind of icing or something like that. But back here, it's really not going to be much of an issue, not at least a foreseeable future, hopefully. The tail is really an interesting design. Mooney's big thing was he wanted to reduce drag at any cost, whatever he could do to reduce drag. And he had experimented with some trim tabs and so on and so forth. But when you've got trim tabs, you've got drag. And so his idea was what if there was a way to create the, a tail that would move the entire way. By the way, the tail's on backwards. That's kind of the obvious thing. Right? Well, the tail's on backwards. No, I, I think that's the way that they all should be. His idea with that was that having the leading edge of the vertical stab forward would produce better stall spin recovery, and it would basically be taking a bite of air, a more abrupt bite of air, as you're recovering from a stall spin. And, that was his design, and some people think that reduces drag. I'm not sure that that really helps much, although it, it very well could play a part. We're kind of showing our age on the paint, so it's going to be time for some touch-up or a repaint before too long. I wanted to talk about this. This is a service bulletin that came out in January, and there's an AD that's going to drop in two days. And it's basically on these counterweights, and you can see how the counterweights had cracked and different things like that. Basically, I had to have an a and come out, take a magnet, make sure that there's no material, uh, a hybrid style weight material, that these are 100% lead. You can tell by looking at them that they're 100% lead and what the affected counterweights uh, look like. And it's, it's pretty obvious, but it's something I did have to have signed off anyway. And they've had some control uh, flutter, some failures in flight. I'm not sure if that's how recent that's been. I think that it could have been years ago. But the reason it covered all models was in, in the case that 
uh, an affected elevator or a, a damaged elevator had been replaced with an F model was particularly the, the elevator in question. And they had fluted edges, they had uh, fluted skin. And the reason for that was actually to reduce drag. They believed that it created some kind of suction and that was actually a drag reducer. The big thing with the C model is you have a short rudder. And by the way, this is called a short body. The C, E, both short bodies, the B, short body. What's the difference between a A, a B, a C, and a D? Not much. You've got the wood wing on the A. But the D, the master, was actually a fixed gear version of this aircraft. And after you're, you obtain your private pilot's license and all that, it's basically a trainer, they would uh, send you a kit to convert it to a C model and retractable gear, constant speed props. So it's really kind of an interesting way that they did things in trying to build uh, the aviation interest. This is for IFR. So if you're in the soup and you find yourself without a pin, you just push pause, you get out, you walk back here and climb back here and you grab your pin. No, not at all. It, it does really uh, work well for that if you're in the hangar like we are today. This is actually a slipstream reducer and their design, their idea behind the design was that it breaks the airflow as it's coming off the tail and somehow reduces drag. Does it? I don't know. <laughs> Ask the engineers, but I think that all of these speed mods, again, are kind of cumulative in the way that they work. And of course, you've got factory gap seals. Those are all factory, as well as on the uh, rudder. The F model, the G model, which is a carbureted version of the F model. So it's got an O360 just like this compared to the IO360 and the F and the uh, Js. They actually have a full length elevator, or full length rudder, excuse me. And that does give you a little bit more crosswind correction capability, but, uh, and they say you don't wanna get these in a flat spin because they might not come out. I think it would probably recover just fine. And by the way, as far as stalls go, this aircraft stalls fine. If you keep the ball in the center, it's gonna react just like any other aircraft. And they do tend to drop a wing with a laminar flow wing. People are really kind of afraid of the laminar flow wing a lot of times, but you know, uh, keep your flight coordinated and you're going to be just fine. Something I always try to do on the pre-flight is just move that and basically that's going to check the play and the jack screw to make sure there is none and that uh, jack screw is located just where the sheet metal is pr protruding there. That's actually where the entire tail moves and that again creates less drag. Something interesting about the short bodies is the longer bodies, the elevator will tend to sag a little bit. On the short bodies, I guess it's just the way the springs are, and they're, they're technically called bungees, the, even though they're just basically a spring. Uh, Mooney uh, calls those bungees, and I guess that kind of just lifts the elevator a little bit. So we'll walk on around. Of course, you've got your VOR antennas at the, uh, leading, on the leading edge of the vertical stab. They call the, uh, the light, the uh, anti-collision light, a coffee grinder. And I've actually got a later model one uh, up in the center of the belly, but that actually works really well for night flying. And if you really want visibility, have them both on, and boy, it, it really does well. Something else they did in 68, I'm not admittedly a huge fan of, but it's the fixed step. It goes all the way in and connects to the fire. A lot of, a lot of the earlier ones had a crank up step and they say, you know, yeah, you can crank it up. Uh, 68G models, F models had a vacuum step, vacuum actuated. So when the engine dies, it retracts the step. When you crank up the engine, it pulls the step in. How effective is having the step out or uh, in? You know, I'm not sure that it makes too much difference on drag, but I guess every little bit helps. And so this is designed exactly like an airfoil, exactly like a wing. And so I've heard of people leaving the step down and that it really doesn't make that much difference. So the baggage door, you don't want to ever slam anything on a Mooney. It's always shut, lock, same with the door. Why the baggage door is so high? Space frame. You can't have a baggage door on the side unless you've got some ways to disconnect links and, and all that sort of thing and slide your bags in, but it's actually 
wide enough to accommodate, uh, plenty of junk back there, but wide enough to accommodate anything that you need to get in there, except for my wife's suitcase. It won't quite fit. So, as we uh, go up the wing walk, of course, you gotta be careful to not step on the flap, but we'll go on and take a look inside. Same with the door. Unlock, open. There's no graceful way to get into a Mooney that you just kind of pile into it the best that you possibly can. And that's, that's really kind of the loading procedure. Now, the, I always get in first, move the front seat forward, move my seat forward, allow uh, passengers to get in the back. And the thing about short bodies, they are great, they are fast, but they are just not, they're, they're great aircraft for two people in bags. Short local trips, four people, fine. But I don't know anybody that short of, you know, that unless they're really short or children that would want to go three, four hours in this thing. Endurance, probably about five hours. And so you've got quite a bit of endurance and it burns about, I, I plan for about nine and a half, ten gallons an hour. It's really about eight and a half. You know, it's kind of like the fish stories. You know, the Mooney guys always have these fish stories. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, 180 miles an hour, you know, on three gallons an hour, you know what I mean, or whatever it is. So, no, it's really about 145 knot airplane is what I typically see is about 145 knots. This wing really works well at about 7,500 to 8,500 feet. So we'll pile in, I'll show you a few things, and there's certainly nothing special about this aircraft as far as avionics are concerned. This is just a timer and uh, you've got your typical six pack. This is actually a Lazar mod that allowed everything. The way that the panel layout from the factory is really kind of wonky. You've got attitude indicator up here and the DG down here and everything's kind of just all over the place. But this actually kind of uh, com compounds everything and uh, makes it really, really effective for IFR. It's an older GPS, uh, older KX-155 kind of your workhorse, but it does really great. And I would like to do uh, some upgrades to the 375 at some point, and maybe a couple of uh, GI 275s or uh, G5s at some point. But uh, got an older JPI, older uh, fuel flow. It works really well. As far as engine monitoring, it tells you everything you need to know. Uh, it does great. Dual altimeters, which is kind of strange. I'm not sure exactly why they did that, but it is pretty nice. If you do have one that's a little off, you can always cross check it. And of course your OAT and your ELT. Okay. The interesting thing about this is the J-Bar. This is kind of the bread and butter of the vintage Mooney. And people will say, well, they're kind of hard to actuate and this and that and the other. As long as your wife's purse isn't here, they work fine. You know, if you keep the purse out of the middle, then you can actually actuate the J-Bar and it locks in the floor. It does great. I love the J-Bar. It, it's bulletproof. This is the only aircraft, to my knowledge, that doesn't have a backup system for the gear, for uh, the landing gear extension, because it's just so effective. And when you're on short final, my short final checklist, if everything else has gone wrong, and I know that that bar is against the firewall, against the uh, panel, then we're in good shape. If everything else goes wrong, we're going to land with gear down. And so uh, that's something you've got to look at. And this is the flap handle. And so instead of your manual flaps or even electric flaps, this is really kind of an interesting system. The handle goes down. You pump about six pumps is what you need for flap retraction and, and flap extension. Six pumps does it and uh, gets you where you need to be. Typical manifold, fuel flow, pressure, all, all that sort of thing. Just typical stuff that you'd normally see. Your air vent is actually up here. And if you look on top of the fuselage, you can actually see it opening and closing. And the way that uh, the later Moonies were designed, the early ones were just not great for airflow, and they developed a, a little more, a few more vents. They developed an inlet on the co-pilot side, and that actually gives lots of airflow. So in summertime, especially up at 7,500, it stays really cool. It's pretty nice. So this side is going to be just a bit more boring. It's got 
everything that the other side does except for the stall horn pitot tube and it's got this weird green light i'm not sure what that's about there's a red one on the other side i still hadn't figured that out yet but uh, anyway we do have a trans am here and uh, this is kind of one i've had for a few months and if you want to see more of it then click on the link and uh, this will take you to eric's other video we're going to do a little walk around of it later This is the inlet that I was talking about earlier. And uh, of course, it's, this was actually 680102. So it was the 102nd aircraft produced in 68. 6801 November. What's great about the Zeus fasteners on the uh, earlier aircraft, you had to take out 50,000 screws for a proper pre-flight. And really to properly pre-flight flight this thing, if you're going cross country, I really like to pull these side panels off and that really gives you access to the entire engine. Matter of fact, you pull the top cowling off, pull the side panels off, you got the whole thing right there. To pull the bottom cowling, not a lot of fun. I try not to do that when I don't really have to, except for annual and stuff like that. But we walk back around, we kind of see the ARI cowling. That is a 201 spinner. A lot of these have a painted spinner, little short stubby thing. They're kind of ugly, but you know, the 201 spinner kind of dolls it up a little bit so it kind of makes it nice so as far as your access door that's pretty much all that you get there's not a whole lot there um, it, mechanics hate these things because there is just hardly any room and you think well how much room do you really need you find that out when you're taking the mags off and sending them down to ais and honey grove which they are really awesome for your mag rebuild services so they, they do a fantastic job and these were just done last annual so it's really, really runs nicely. Triad did the engine overhaul on this. It's mid time. It's got about 800 hours on it since overhaul. And really, it, and that was in 2014. So it's really done quite a bit of flying between then and now and has just been totally rock solid, had no issues. Eric, I think that's probably just about it. I'd like to talk a little bit about just the Mooney you know, when somebody buys a Mooney, I say, well, welcome to the cult <coughs> club, you know, because they really are kind of a cultish airplane. And, you know, there's all of these different myths that some others have done a pretty good job of dispelling. But one myth is that they're smaller than every other aircraft. The difference is they sit a little bit lower to the runway. They sit just a little bit lower than some of your legacy aircraft. So people think, well, they're not as safe because they don't look as big, different things like that or the, the cabin's too narrow. It's the exact same cabin width as a Piper Cherokee. It's a little bit shorter, there's a little more legroom in a Cherokee, but it actually has the same width as far as from panel to panel, port to starboard, it's all the same. You sit down lower, you kind of wear a Mooney. It's kind of a sports car. It's the Porsche or the piston singles. People talk about, well, the Moonies are so fast. It's not about exactly how fast they are as much as it is about how efficient they are to burn, you know, 10, nine gallons an hour, doing 145 knots, you just can't really beat that except for maybe an RV. RVs are great, but as far as the certified world is concerned, it really, really does well. The landing gear, absolutely bulletproof. Well, they bounce and this and that and the other. If you land them, you know, like a Cessna 150 and you know, a student pilot, you're out there trying to land at 100 miles an hour, yeah, it's gonna float. But if you stay on your airspeeds, it's gonna do just fine. They can bounce if you land too hard, but put a little power in, it'll settle right back down. The third bounce, or the, after the second bounce, you better do a go around because the third's usually when the prop is struck. So they were actually able to certify the clearance, the low prop clearance, because of the way the landing gear functions. It doesn't have a strut and oleo or anything that compresses. So with the rubber donuts, the tire flat, You've still got, I believe, nine inches of clearance. It's usually plenty. I always say use caution if you're functioning on a grass strip or unknown terrain. And you know, another myth, they, they are not grass strip airplanes. If the grass is smooth, then you're fine. We've also seen some gears fold up, the Johnson bar folding up because of a block that has a little too much wear. The wear tolerances aren't where it needs to be. And that can actually you know, if you're jarring around and stuff like that, it can unlock and fold up. Really bad day. I pretty much tell everybody, do not touch that bar. My block's in great shape, but Lazar does sell replacements. I've heard they're a little tight 
Uh, so they do have to go in and do some machining on some of those just to get them to where they fit just right, just because the tolerances are so tight. The exhaust is pretty much stock exhaust. They do a power flow uh, conversion on those and that really works well. Uh, they're a little louder. The cabin has actually been upgraded with sound deadening material and the quieter exhaust. So on a long trip, 2400 RPM and full manifold pressure, it usually makes it pretty decent to live with. And uh, it, 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 it's not, not too loud. Of course, the A20s, you know, the, all the world's right when you turn the A20s on. So I guess that's really about it. Um, again, it's kind of a different aircraft. The, you know, nothing wrong with J models. They do have, you know, electric everything uh, as far as your gears electric, your flaps are electric. Brian and I were talking one day and I'd found a 205. I said, okay, this is great. You know, late 80s, 205, the paint was in great shape. The panel was a little nicer. And I started thinking about this and it, basically because of the leg room, you've got just a little bit more leg room. And I thought, okay, so I'd be giving up hydraulic flaps, I'd be giving up manual cow flaps, I'd be giving up manual gear. And I started really thinking about that. I was like, everything electric? And I just, just like, you know, Everything is bulletproof on this, and even the you know the carbureted engine. It's like my, my mechanic friend says, you can fix it with a rock and a hammer, and that's you know maybe a little exaggerative, but uh, that's typically you know kind of what what, are, what you're dealing with with the uh, carbureted engines. So uh, lots of parts availability, different things like that. Mooney's had a lot of financial troubles in the past, and there's been kind of a long history of I don't know if necessarily financial mismanagement, but just kind of this jaded thing. Uh, I actually had a lien I found on this aircraft as I was purchasing it from 1968 where the Mitsubishi Corporation had placed a lien on it. What's that about? Well Mitsubishi owned Mooney in 1968 so I guess financially to bail themselves out or, or essentially to fund the company they would purchase these aircraft and just Mitsubishi company put liens on them. So Luckily, Mitsubishi's still in business. I called him up, was able to get the uh, CEO or the CFO, uh, talked to him, and we got the lane removed, no problem. So aviation is not something I thought that I would ever be involved in and had not really grown up around it, although I'd flown some model airplanes and different things. But where there is a will, there's a way. And getting around the airport, if you have an interest in aviation, just get around the airport, get around pilots, and there's always somebody out on a Saturday morning that's willing to take you up and go for a flight. So God's really blessed me. Uh, not only did I never think that'd be an aircraft owner, but certainly not a Mooney owner. And it's just amazing with uh, ingenuity, hard work, and persistence is the biggest thing. Just, you know, to get that ticket, the pilot ticket, the private, and the instrument, it's been kind of a, a stretch, but uh, we're finally looking like we're coming to the close of that. So appreciate you coming out and uh, taking a look at the old Mooney and hope that uh, you guys enjoy the video.